wisdom of our God revealed in all the universe, all things created by his hand and held together at his command. He knows the mysteries of the seas, the secret of the stars are hid. He guides the planets on and turns the earth through another day. The matchless wisdom of his ways, the mark of God, of righteousness, his word a lamp unto my feet, his spirit me wisdom from above to pray for peace and cling to love and teach me humbly to receive the sun and rain of your sovereignty each stand of sorrow has a place within this tapestry of grace so through the trials I choose to say As we come to worship our Lord and Saviour, <coughs> please stand if you're comfortable and able to do so. Let's sing together. Hallelujah. Sing to Jesus.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning, everybody. Please have a seat. It's good to be here on such a gorgeous day. It's absolutely beautiful out there. Not too windy, just right. I have some plants to put in. So obviously we're going to race through this service really, really quickly so I can get out in the garden. No, that's not true. Um, we will take our time as usual. It's great that those of you who are joining us on the live stream are there as well and that we are all together. And in the spirit of that, let us say together the prayer of unity. Almighty and everlasting God, as we come together as your church, the body of Christ, we thank you that we can worship you together, even if we are not in the same place. We thank you for this opportunity to pray together and remember each other at this time. Thank you that you have brought us safely to this day, and we ask that you keep us from danger, guide us in all that we do, and may what we do be righteous in your sight. Bless us now, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we come today, today we are celebrating the feast of St. Thomas the Apostle, which is why Karen and I are looking pretty splendid in our red stoles, now that we've remembered to put them on. Um, but fortunately, we work with some very good people that remember that it is red on a feast day. So that's why we're wearing red today. And I'm looking forward to hearing Karen's sermon. Um, Thomas, as you know, is often known as Doubting Thomas. And I don't, I don't want to say too much in case Karen's going to talk about this in the sermon. But I am always very comforted by Thomas because we all have doubts. And to know that he who um, had doubts was actually one of Christ's apostles and took the gospel out is quite comforting. And also rather nice because yesterday um, the Syrian Orthodox Church met here. And um, for those of you that aren't aware, they're not from Syria. I guess most of you know that. They're actually from a particular part of India called Kerala, or the, the church originated there. And it originated there because St. Thomas actually went to southern India to spread the gospel. So it seems quite appropriate that we're here today on St. Thomas's Day and our brothers and sisters in Christ from the Syrian Orthodox Church were here yesterday. I love a bit of continuity. So as we prepare to worship, let's say together the words of the prayer of preparation. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And just as Thomas sometimes has had doubts, and we also sometimes have doubts, we also have things that we do that we really wish we hadn't and that we know are not good in God's eyes. But we also know that he is ever merciful. So let's just take a moment to name in our hearts those things that are troubling us before we say together the prayer of confession. And we say together, God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of that we fail to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And because we have been forgiven, it is good to sing songs of praise. So we're going to sing now, You Alone Are Worthy. So please stand if you feel able to do so as we sing together. <coughs> ascend to heaven, we say together the collect for today, the feast of Thomas the Apostle. Almighty and eternal God, who for the firmer foundation of our faith followed your holy apostle Thomas to doubt the resurrection of your son till word and sight convinced him. Grant to us who have not seen that we may also believe and so confess Christ as our Lord and our God, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading. Today's first reading comes from Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for our gospel reading.
Hear the gospel of our Lord to Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you. Now Thomas, one of, the one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other, other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe you. One week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Through the doors were locked, Jane Jesus came to stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O May I speak in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. I doubt if this lovely weather will continue. I doubt if there will be an end to this recession anytime soon. I doubt if Jane will ever eat meat. I doubt if everyone will stay awake during my sermon. Doubts, we all have them, and they are usually based on some evidence. The doubts I've mentioned are based on past experience, reason, and facts. They are reasonable doubts. And it's a term that you will hear in many courtrooms. At a conference for barristers, the following question was set as a warm-up activity. Explain the phrase, beyond a reasonable doubt, and how it applies to criminal cases. Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been on jury service, but if you have, you'll know that word doubt crops up several times in a courtroom being a legal term, meaning there is enough evidence to convict somebody of a crime. And the court will find someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, the case must be proved by the prosecution. But it might surprise you to know that courts and legal scholars have not reached a consensus on the exact definition of the term reasonable doubt. As a result, the instructions trial judges give juries can differ from place to place and from court to court within a place. The instructions must inform the jury they must judge the guilt of the defendant according to a high degree of certainty. But as we know, mistakes can be made. And I'm going to illustrate this by a film that is called Beyond a Reasonable Doubt made in the 1950s. It tells the story of a newspaper editor who opposes the death penalty and wants to prove a point about the inadequacy of circumstantial evidence. So he plans a hoax case in an attempt to expose the ineptitude of the city's hardline district attorney. The plan is to plant clues which will lead to his friend's arrest for the recent murder of a female nightclub dancer. Once he is found guilty, the setup will be revealed and humiliate the district attorney. Well, his friend agrees to the plan and is subsequently convicted on circumstantial evidence. But in true drama style, the reporter dies in a car accident before he can clear his friend's name. And to add to the drama, the photographic evidence the editor intended to use to clear him after his trial is burned to an unrecognizable state. Well, bad luck happens, doesn't it? 
He remains on death row in prison. But in the nick of time, to prove the two men's intentions, written testimony of the dead man is discovered and his friend is pardoned in true movie style. But that's not the end of the film. The plot thickens. And if you want to find out, you'll have to watch it and find out the rest. Well, you might by now be wondering where all this is leading and why I'm telling you all this. What relevance does any of this have to today's readings and the whole point of this sermon today? Well, I'm hoping it has woken you up and grabbed your attention. And perhaps afterwards, it might prompt you to remember what the topic of the sermon was or is. To prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to have evidence. And this is what brings us to today's passage from John and Thomas's doubts. And we can learn some priceless lessons from Thomas, which we will look at in a moment. I'm sure we have all lived with doubt several times in our faith. Does it seem natural and undeniable one moment that God exists and cares for the world and the next moment uncommonly naive? How certain are you that God knows, that, that you know God's desires concerning specific political, social, and moral issues facing our society? Do you ever wonder? if there really is a God, a heaven, a hell? Do you ever doubt that prayer makes a difference? Do you ever doubt your own relationship with God? If you can connect with any of these doubts, I have some promising news for you. You are just like the rest of us, even your ministers. Do you know that even the strongest servants of God in the Bible had their doubts? If you read the Psalms, you will find that David had his doubts. Read Ecclesiastes and discover that Solomon had his doubts. Read Job, it is full of doubt. Read the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, a God-called preacher, and you will find his doubt drove him to tears. The church has been badly infected with a spiritual virus called doubt since its beginning. But there is nothing wrong with it. Faith presumes doubt. Faith's nature dictates it must be preceded by doubt. If there is no room for doubt, there is no place for faith. And I like the way that this author put it. If faith never encounters doubt, if truth never struggles with error, if good never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? But there is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt asks questions, while unbelief won't even listen to the answers. So if you are dealing with doubt these days, doubt about God, about his goodness, about his grace, even about his very existence, Thomas can teach us how to do away with doubt. He was able to starve his doubt and feed his faith. And he shows us exactly how to do it. First, let me set the scene for you. Jesus had been raised from the dead. He had appeared to all the disciples except Thomas. When the disciples tried to convince Thomas they had seen Jesus alive, Thomas doubted. And he was the only one who doubted. But the reason was he'd not been with the rest of his disciples when they'd seen Jesus and spoken to him. He'd missed an opportunity to both fulfill his doubt and fortify his faith. If you're living in the middle of doubt right now, the first question you need to ask yourself is this. 
Why do I doubt? Often doubt has a common cause similar to these things. When a sudden unforeseen tragedy comes into our lives, we instantly begin to doubt the goodness of God. When we pray at length for a particular outcome without the desired result, we doubt the power of God. We live right. We endeavor to do what God wants us to do, and we still suffer for it. And it's then we doubt the justice of God. Sometimes sin in our lives causes us to doubt because living in sin pushes us further away from God. And the further we are from him, the more we will doubt him or our relationship with him. With Thomas, it was his absence from the fellowship. He was not where he should have been when he should have been. But then Thomas did something that is essential to dealing successfully with doubt. He expressed how he felt. Many people live their lives every day sitting silently in the dark room of doubt, too ashamed to let anybody know what they are feeling. They are afraid of what people might think if they knew about their doubts about Jesus, God, the Bible, or the church, or even the purpose and meaning of life. We need to give Thomas credit where credit is due. He had the courage to interrogate the crowd. He had the courage to raise his hand. He had the courage to pose a question. And he had the courage to demand an answer. The Bible says the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. But this was not the first time Thomas had expressed his doubt. In John 14, Jesus first taught about heaven with his disciples. He spoke these now famous words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me. Where I am, you may also be. You know where I am going, and you know the way. And Jesus had barely finished these great words before Thomas asked, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And every other disciple was probably thinking the same thing. But only Thomas had the courage to ask. He wasn't trying to be argumentative or rude, but he had honest doubts about what Jesus had said. Well, I don't know about you, but I thank God that Thomas had that courage because it opened the door for Jesus to give one of the greatest statements of faith as an answer to one of the greatest questions of doubt. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice how Jesus handled Thomas's doubts. Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't look at him and say, you idiot. Have you not learned after all the time I've spent with you where I am going and how you can get there with me? Jesus respected his honest question and gave him an honest answer. God is big enough to handle any question you throw at him. In fact, God is not the least bit insulted by your doubts if you're honest with him. Don't you think he'd rather have you be honest with him by simply expressing your doubts than living a lie 
and confessing a counterfeit faith. faith. He knows what is going on inside you anyway. He knows the doubts you have. Nothing catches him by surprise. When you express your doubts, you're on the road to learning whether, you are, whether they are well-founded. This will help you reach the point where you can finally do away with doubt. And one man put it this way, when does doubt become unbelief? And the answer is, when you let it. The first step to deciding whether your doubt is justified is to examine the facts. And that's exactly what Thomas meant when he said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, he wanted to examine the facts for himself. True doubt never overlooks the facts. It persistently pursues the truth. Thomas wasn't going to believe what other people believed merely because they told him. He wanted to investigate for himself. He wanted to touch the hands of Jesus, feel his scars, put his fingers in the spear wound in his side and discover the truth for himself. It's like me preaching a sermon. I do my best by the grace of God and the power of God to be a woman of God. Whenever I stand here giving a sermon, I try to preach the truth of God by the Spirit of God. But I don't want you to blindly believe everything I say or agree with everything I preach. And that might shock some of you. Because you have not only the freedom, but also the responsibility to check out everything I say and make sure it lines up with the truth of God's word. In the New Testament, there is a little church mentioned in Berea where the Apostle Paul preached. This is what Luke wrote about the congregation there. The people in Berea were much nicer than those in Thessalonica, and they gladly accepted the message. Day after day, they studied the scriptures to see if these things were true. They had open minds, and they confirmed truth for themselves. So one of the most sensible ways you can starve your doubt and feed your faith is to study the Bible. Read the Word of God. The entire book of 1 John was written to dispel the doubts of Christians who wondered whether they had a genuine relationship with God. There is nothing wrong with doubt, but there is something wrong with doubt that refuses to examine the facts. It has been well said that a Christian should believe simply, but a Christian should, should not just simply believe. Somebody, somewhere, is going to dispute your faith sooner or later. Not knowing why you believe what you believe is just as bad as not knowing what you believe. We need to examine the facts so we know not only what we believe, but also why we believe it. So when you doubt, eliminate the cause, express the doubt, and examine the facts. Because by doing so, you are not just dealing with your doubt, you are strengthening your faith. And this leads to the last step where you trust in God's goodness and love and are able to do away with doubt. After Thomas examined the facts, he evaluated the proof. And here is the result. Then Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. 
Do you know one reason many people refuse to confront their doubts? Because deep down, they are afraid their doubts are true, that their doubts will win, that what they believe has been wrong. But no skeptic can come up with a doubt God doesn't have an answer for. If you examine the facts about Jesus Christ, examine the facts about the truth in the Bible, and evaluate the proof, you will find evidence that demands a positive verdict. The Bible is true. God is real. And Jesus Christ is just who he said he was. Christ dwells among us, just as Jesus stood amongst his disciples in a locked room, so he stands here with us in all places. We just have to reach our arms out to him, acknowledge him, and believe. Believe that Christ is our Lord and God, and that he is alive and with us now. Believe that, as John goes on to tell us, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name, because there is plenty of evidence in the Bible to prove who Jesus is beyond all reasonable doubt. We cannot physically touch the Lord Jesus Christ, but seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. Amen. Thank you, Karen. Lots of food for thought there. So as we reflect on all that Karen has spoken of, let's stand and say together the words of the Creed. <clears throat> we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for our time of prayer. Today's prayers were written by Nikki. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Lord God, we lift before you the universal church, all those brought together through faith in Christ. We ask that you help us to see, recognise and praise you through the ups and downs. We know that life can be complicated. For some, for some, declaring your name is dangerous. They are persecuted and ostracated. We ask for you to draw near to all your people today. Those who have not seen, yet still they believe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for our diocese the bishops, archdeacons, area deans and all clergy. We ask for a fresh outpouring of your spirit upon them. Give them strength, courage and wisdom that they may grow in faith and lead your people. Lord, we thank you for those who in, in lay leadership and ministry, those with hearts that are open to step out in faith and serve for your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundance, we lift up to you our parish of St. Andrews with Holy Cross and the community we serve. We ask you to give us vision 
and lead us in the way that you want us to go. Help us to serve humbly and to see you in the places that we may not always be visible. Break, break our hearts, Lord, for the good, for the things that break yours, and equip us to go out into the world sharing the good news. We thank you for the buildings you have entrusted us with, and, for, and we ask that every person who walks through these doors, for whatever reason, will feel your presence with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of justice, we pray for our world leaders. Just watching the news can leave us feeling shaken, distraught and in despair. We ask that all leaders come under your rule and submit to your will. We pray for confidence and hope for a time when your world will be a place of peace and justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for the natural world and all its resources. This place you made and its abundant provision. Help us to right the things that have gone wrong, for the damage caused to be undone, so that all beings and life can once again thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, who sees and knows us, in a moment of silence, we bring before you all those who are in any kind of need. Those on our weekly prayer diary, the parish WhatsApp, the those who are who we hold in our hearts, and those who are only known to you. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand if you're able for the peace. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please exchange a sign of peace in whichever way you are comfortable to do so. Peace be with you. We're going to remain standing as we sing our offertory <coughs> song, Rejoice, Rejoice. Christ is in the hope of glory in our hearts. He lives, 
His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth, you have spoken your word and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. For we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven evermore, praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet, in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation, loving us to the end. He gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. Amen, Amen. Lord, we believe. On the night he gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen, Amen. Lord, we believe. Therefore, we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption, Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Look with favour on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth. Heal the sick. Let the oppressed go free and fill your church with power from on high. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. 
Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with St. Andrew, St. Thomas and all your saints at the table in your kingdom where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. We forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The body of Christ broken for us all. The blood of Christ shed for us all.
We pray together. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life. By the power of your Spirit, keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our last song today, which is Lord, I come before your throne of grace. So please stand if you're able to do so.
three seeds. Another busy week in the life of this parish is heading, we are heading into. Um, just to remind you that next Saturday, well actually you can have a really good day on Saturday. We can have a good day most days. But on Saturday at 8 o'clock you can come to the prayer breakfast and then you can stay and come to the fete. Or you can come to the prayer breakfast and not come to the fete. Or you could come to the fete and not come to the prayer breakfast. So many options. But please do try to get along to one of those events because I know that they are going to be really wonderful. Um, we have Edna's funeral on Tuesday here um, at 11.30. Um, Edna's family would love to see as many of you as are able to come for the church service. The committal is going to be a private family committal, but I know Edna's family would love to see as many of her church family as are able to make it on Tuesday. So please keep Edna's family in your thoughts and prayers. Now, today is a very special day. Not only is it St Thomas's Day, but we have got a really special birthday. Gloria, would you mind putting Norma front and centre, please? Uh, facing, no, facing her public. <laughs> so. Now, it is Norma's birthday today. It's a very special birthday. Now, I'm not sure whether I should disclose Norma's age. Norma, are you happy for me to tell you? That's all right. Norma is, now you're probably thinking Norma's 21. Slightly, slightly wrong. Norma is actually 90 today. So we need to sing very loudly to Norma. And I rather think there's a special cake and card which Marion and Barbara might be able to, well, they're, they're displaying beautifully, well, Marion is, Barbara's not so much, but I mean, <laughs> perhaps they, oh, thank you, they might like to bring it forward. Aidan might like to go and get Norma's card and bring that. Aidan, do you want to go and get Norma's card? Off you go. Are you going to give Norma her card? And it's a very special card because Barbara has made the card and lots of people have signed it. If you haven't had the chance to sign the card, please do so. Shall we sing? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Norma, happy birthday to you. So please do stay and celebrate with Norma and eat some of the delicious cake which I believe Cathy has made. Uh, I'm, that's, that's the, you, good plan. Ladies, would you mind bringing it to the front? I mean, you, Kathy might want to do that because I know... Because yeah, <laughs> she, she's quite sort of like... <laughs> Kathy's just having a moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very beautiful cake. Can we name the person who made it? Kathy made it, yeah. Uh. I have to say there aren't 90 candles on it, because I hadn't done the risk assessment for that. Sorry, Norma. <laughs> so. Anyway, we wish Norma a really, really happy birthday. And it's lovely that she's going to spend the morning of her birthday with her church family. So please stand for the blessing. The 
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and those you love and pray for, and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Singing what a faithful 